Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friends of the Force, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, Brad. And I'm your host, Sarah. And this week on the show, we are hosting the one, the only, the Golden Gorg Awards. It is the second annual awards show here on Friends of the Force, the only place you will find Gorgs that are golden. I hope. I hope. <laughs> I hope this is the only place you'll find Gorgs that are golden. But let me tell you, we are so excited to be back this year with now our second annual Golden Gorgs Awards, which is, wow, just that became very difficult to say there for a second. It's a mouthful. But let me tell you, let me tell you, listener, if you have not, if you're going Golden Gorgs, Gorgs Awards, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? It's because we we hit it. In another episode last year, (laughs) the episode wasn't titled The Golden Gorgs Awards. It was a history of Star Wars at the Oscars, where we combined a couple of our favorite things being Star Wars and the movie awards season. And we did a whole episode about it. We talked all about, well, as the name suggests, the history of the presence of Star Wars at the Oscar Awards, specifically with A New Hope and then into the present. Uh, And then we talked about some of our we, we duped it out in an award style fashion and we handed awards to some of our favorite performances from the star wars films and we are so excited to be back this year to fight to ruin our friendship yes over our favorite star wars things here on friends of the forest we ruin friendships plot twist <laughs> you would you would think <laughs> last year's episode though is actually like one of my favorites that we've done so i would definitely recommend checking that out and in light of the oscars this week uh, we thought now was the good time to do it. So we are recording this before the upcoming Academy Awards on Sunday. I'm not sure when this episode will be dropping. It'll probably be dropping sometime during the weekend. But if you're listening, this is a good primer for the for the Oscars. So I hope you're ready, book book uh, book fans out there, because this year we are covering books on the Golden Gorgs, uh, which is funny because it started out with movies, and here we are talking about books on a book podcast. So the rules don't matter. The points don't matter. Books on a book podcast in an awards in awards show format that is like the movie awards. We love to bring chaos. Yeah, we love to bring chaos to our podcast. Does it have to make sense at any point in time? No, but we are here and we are ready to go. Yeah, it's like Bebo's Book Report. You know, a podcast series about about a TV show that has nothing to do with books. You know, it's same same vein, same vein. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, which we're so here for. Um, But before we kind of get into the awards, Brad, an important part of any award show is the fashion. Oh. So in our award show, you know, as as the host, as the uh, as the judge of all the awards here, I'm wearing a, a gorgeous, stunning floor length gown. My hair is done up. You could see me walk through those halls of Canto Bite. Mm. You know, you could even see me walking up to the opera. Um. At, at, on on Coruscant, you know what? I am dressed to the nines, and that's what I am telling the people. Mm. Well, uh, me, I I am I am cosplaying as guy who accidentally walked on the set of a Star Wars movie. I have <laughs> white Adidas socks inside of my black Adidas slides, and I have Adidas Adidas shorts on, and I am wearing a hoodie that says Iceland on it with some Nordic letters that my parents got me. Oh, shout out I to mom didn't and dad. even go to Thanks Iceland. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a total fraud. Frauds of the force. Well, you know what? We're, we're, we, we've seen in fashion trends over the past many years that like a- athleisure, comfy fashion is really in style right now. So, yes, you can totally walk the red carpet in your Adidas shorts and, uh, you know, socks and slides. Okay. I'm, I won't comment on you it. Know, you might get roasted. You might get roasted might. on the fashion channels after after our award show airs but you know what i'm not gonna judge you now because that's not my place we're here to adjudicate some awards listen listen i i gotta defend myself here i feel like i'm 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 attacked i'm being attacked right now listen you decided to be honest slides are comfortable socks are comfortable why would you not have twice the comfort it just it it just makes sense it mathematically two is better than one that is why we have two (laughs) hosts on this show now yes yes i'm the socks you're the slides because oh, because okay. you, you, you slid in halfway through the life of the podcast and then now you're the great co-host wait is the fine is the podcast almost over we have an announcement folks oh. <laughs> okay uh, no, halfway, we don't. Halfway, no we don't you can't cancel my award show before it even happens <laughs> halfway through the current 
running career of the podcast, relatively okay. speaking. Okay. This podcast is going. Mm-hmm. Sarah signed the contract. She's here for the next 25 years. It's the biggest podcasting deal ever signed by anybody. Um, forget the oh. NFL players. This is this is okay. a, a $0 deal uh, oh. for for 25 years of time and effort wow. and, and um, books. Sounds like parenthood. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, that's okay. Because when we are here in now 24 years and we're hosting the 25th annual Golden Gorgs Awards, we will be able to have our own retrospective on our own fake awards show. Think about it. Just think about it. The the listeners who don't have kids now might have kids in the future and they can say, hey, kids, <laughs> I was around for the first Golden Gorgs. And they're like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? What's a Gorg? You're so old, dad. That's so weird. Yeah. What's a Gorg? And speaking of what's a Gorg, you know what? Last year, we totally didn't even get give any honor to the Gorg itself. So I think we should maybe mm. give a brief overview of Gorgs. Did you know their homeworld okay. is Tatooine? Did you know that? No. Are you lying to me I am right not. now? And guess what? Did you know that Gorgs made an appearance in Star Wars The Phantom Menace? Stop lying. I am not You're lying. Playing. I am not lying. <laughs> so, little known fact. When Jar Jar is attempting to use his tongue to steal some good food off the streets of Tatooine, he actually takes a gork off the off the thing. Mm. That's the thing he spits into Sebulba's bowl of soup is a gorg. That's a Wikipedia. I, that's what Wikipedia says. That's what Wikipedia says. And thanks to our friends over at Wikipedia for their for their uh, you know research knowledge uh, in in helping us bring the golden gorgs together uh, with this reacher sec- segment. But I don't believe you. It, no, it's it it it's here. It says I the hunt crime lords. I believe that you're reading it. But do I believe it? The hut crime lord Jabba Desejic often ate gorgs, and he swallowed one at the Boon to Eve classic. It's the one we see him put in his mouth. These do not look the same. I know, but as they we've don't look seen, the, same at all. the translation from Great point. <laughs> live action to animation has been a hot topic of the fandom recently. Maybe a little yeah, bit overblown, but you know that's that's a good point. <laughs> but we should also mention that. Our favorite character collectively, um, Niku Vozo of mm. Star Wars Resistance, was, um, you know, he really he really loves a good Gorg. And he, Kazuda Ziono, tries to give him a Gorg as a pet, you know, like to, to apologize, to thank him. And then he immediately eats him. And the reality is, is that Gorgs are delicious. Yeah. Want a Gorg cake? get a gorg cake you know what i'm saying so mm-hmm. tonight we are are celebrating with the gorgs we thought that was the most appropriate besides those resistance appearances gorgs also just have to i have to shout out do make an appearance in battlefront 2 return of the jedi star wars rebels crash of fate mentioned only though and star wars episode 9 the rise of skywalker it's illustrated on a ship somewhere probably ochi's ship i would imagine ochi's sitting okay. there you know Stuck in the Pisana Desert, about to die, and his last wish is just I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a Gorg on the wall. Yeah. Ochi yeah, died what nice. he loved what he loved doing the most. Being an artist. He's the artist <laughs> of our lifetime. Poor Ochi. You can't spoil you can't spoil the upcoming Adam Christopher book like that <laughs> on the pod. Like we signed contracts, Brad. You know that that would that would actually be a really interesting story. Really interesting plot twist, gotta say. If he was just an artist. Mm-hmm. And he's like drawing the maps to find like Ray. He's like creating these like oh, really yeah. sophisticated maps, but they're like very artsy and everyone's like, dude, we just we just need to know the coordinates. He's like, no, it's in my mind. I gotta get it out. He's like an art savant. <laughs> <laughs> Palpatine's like, like, can you chill? He's like, I really, I really wanted to be an artist, but I fell into this job and now I'm just trying to make my passion <laughs> and my, my work align. <laughs> and I want to stab people too at the same time. Oh, oh no. gee, calm down with your dagger, please. That perfectly fits the death star anyways let's continue anyways let's continue we've got an award show to host yes so we are going to go through a couple of categories so we each brought five nominees and we don't know what each other nominated we, we do not know that yet so we're going to essentially put it out there and we're going to try to come to a consensus i think for the most part last year we came to a consensus on every category that we did yeah i think so so to run through the categories before we get into this one. So in your head, you can figure out your own nominees, who you would nominate, who you hope to win. I know this is short notice, 
for making your predictions today. But we are going to be t- talking about the best High Republic novel, the best reference book, the best line slash quote, the best audio drama, our favorite authors, best middle grade, best YA, and best adult. So think about it. Think about your favorites. Who do you want to win? Listeners, now that you've paused the podcast, thought very hard about it, now you're going to hear our nominees, which are the correct nominees. I'm sorry to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we are starting with best High Republic novel. I will go first. So my top five nominees are The Rising Storm by Kevin Scott, Race to Crash Point Tower by Daniel Jose Older. This is in no particular order, by the way. Out of the Shadows by Justina Ireland, Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule, and Into the Dark by Claudia Gray. And I'm such a sucker because I included all five story architects in there. You know, got to give them each a little bit of credit. Each got to give them a Golden Gorg nomination for their works and their books that have just transcended Star Wars storytelling this last year and have Mm -hmm. given me so much joy and purpose in life. Um, I've known these characters and these authors for my whole life. That's how it feels. We've been through the trenches. So where, what are your picks, Sarah? Well, unsurprisingly, we do this podcast together. This might, it's not a surprise to you, I hope. Um, And on that podcast, we read these books together. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that my nominations are almost all the same. Mm. I have the rising storm by Kevin Scott race to crash point tower by Daniel Jose older. Into the Dark by Claudia Gray, A Test of Courage by Justina Ireland, and Ooh. Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule. Dang. Okay, well, mm-hmm. let's talk about the mm-hmm. let's talk about the difference there, which is Justina's. Uh, you picked her middle gray, her first middle gray from wave one, as opposed to her YA from wave two. Uh, yes. Was it that a tough decision to choose between those two to nominate them, or what was your ultimate decision to choose Test of Courage? Sure. My ultimate decision to choose Test of Courage um, came down to like the lasting feeling I got when I was reading that book. Um, And for me, A Test of Courage was a really small scale story, but a really powerful story about grief um, and about moving forward and, and finding yourself in that time. And I think in the time that I read that, which was January 2021, that was a kind of the exact story that I needed in that moment. And for that, and for the characters that it introduced, Avon Saros, my queen. Mm. Um, that's why I went with A Test of Courage. Although Out of the Shadows is an excellent book and a great pick and also introduces some great characters. So I really see it either way. I got to admit, though, I was kind of torn between the two and I almost chose Test of Courage simply because of Emery's dark side story and yeah you know his Mm -hmm. temptation that he felt there as a result of loss and i think ultimately for me out of the shadows got the nomination because i love sylvester yarrow so much i think she's an awesome character and obviously this book had emory and vernestra in it as well and so seeing the republic through sylvester's eyes who you know she's a sort of everyday ordinary human being who is living in a galaxy being attacked by the Nile while her mother actually works for the Nile. And so how do you view the Jedi? How do you view the Republic through all of the, all of the stuff that's happening, the bureaucracy, the corruption, and it's this onion, you know, to reference Shrek here that you keep peeling back and has layers. Yep. And Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvester keeps doing that throughout the book. And I think that is sort of, marvelous to see each time you peel back a layer what's underneath you know and ultimately yeah. we discover that really the republic is a bit rotten to its core uh no different than the republic of the of the prequels you know just in a maybe different way and doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have a sith lord as the as the chancellor although yeah we don't know we don't we don't know what what lena so is hiding up her sleeve who knows but i, I think That's we would true. know by now i think we would know if there is something up with yeah. Lena So. So maybe. Gira Starro seems to be the corrupt politician of the of the era. To our That's knowledge. True. There there's definitely more, probably. Um Tia Toon was definitely a Ugh. a plot twist. I thought he was gonna be a bad guy, but I was like, he's kinda right in some ways. <laughs> in some ways. Some of his thoughts are not the worst thing I've ever no, heard. <laughs> no, you know, he's not entirely wrong about Lena So in some ways, but um for the most part, he's still a shithead, so Okay, so my my gut is to lean towards giving the the win to the Rising Storm because it is just such a perfect book. I 
actually feel like I have to agree with you. This is way too easy okay, for our Golden Gorg's first category. But uh, The Rising Storm, to me, is that novel that just has everything. It has everything. It's got a messy Elzar man. It's got this great friendship between Elzar and Stellan. We've got uh, Kip and Jom. We've got Lena So in politics and Tia Toon and Ty Yorick. And we've got this incredible battle uh, at Valo. We've got that ending that scarred me mm-hmm. <laughs> that scarred both of us uh and we finished the book at the same time which was like personally a really ridiculous thing that happened that was really fun this book punched and it kept punching oh yeah and it was really impressive for that um and like wow it felt like a movie in my head like that's yeah. that was the ultimate success of that book it was so visual and so clear I do want to give credit where credit is due, though, to Light of the Jedi, because I think Rising Storm would not have hit in the way it did if it wasn't for Charles Soule, because ultimately mm-hmm. Charles Soule, in terms of the adult novels, did all of the world building, and he set the stage for what was going to be like that darker middle chapter of, of phase one or phase one, wave wave two, whatever. Um, so really, like, you know, he gave us the introduction to uh bell and to elzar and to avar and i think cavin just elevated it to such new heights you know whereas charles really built the world and made us invested in these characters once we were Mm -hmm. invested cavin just kind of took us deep into their psyches and like into their emotions and ran with that and i just think that is a huge testament to how these authors build off one another yeah you know similarly claudia with into the dark and daniel with race to crash point tower having these really standout characters that sort of uh fit into the larger narrative but also have a more insular um personal intimate story to tell um that is also very like very compelling and very relatable in many ways especially daniel writing so much of the of the younger generation of the higher public through characters like ram and lula um so yeah just just shout out to like all five of these authors i think they're all worthy of a nomination here with their works so oh absolutely so, without a doubt yeah we're choosing so we're choosing the rising storm so congratulations to the rising storm by kevin scott Yay! you have won our first golden gorg of the evening oh, man what a, what a time what a time yay first Please award of the night applause. <laughs> <laughs> we should do this uh at a lie we should just hijack the oscars in like a couple days oh yeah Listeners, if you're listening, uh, tune into NBC Sunday night and you'll see Sarah and I uh, run out onto the stage and Except host the Golden Except it's not Gorgs. on NBC. <laughs> uh, did I say NBC? I made a- ABC. Whatever I said. Okay. I don't know what I said. Yeah. One of the BCs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. CBC. Yes. MSNBC. Mm-hmm. NBC. ABC. Yes. All of them. Anyway, that brings us to our next category, which is best reference book oh this was a now, spicy category i have no idea where we're gonna land on this one or yeah. if we're gonna have any in common at all oh, because there are a bajillion reference books so out many. there and we included canon and legends but i mean like i like i don't know like is there really a difference between canon and legends yes for some books you know uh yes i will say that i have a reference book that is like the 30th anniversary visual dictionary Mm -hmm. and it's like everything and it includes timelines that are no longer considered canon i also have like that star wars encyclopedia which is like three hardcover books and like a bound package and it's like one of my favorite things i own it includes like all of the characters from legends and from It's amazing. I'll have to show it to you after we're done recording this, but like I got it for Christmas one year and it's traveled with me everywhere I go. So that's like, that's like the one book I take with me no matter what. It's, it's amazing. I am making a last minute change to my nominees Uh because I completely forgot one. Um, Uh Oh, did you just forget the one I'm mentioning right now? Or did I, did I jog your memory? It's not, it's not that one. You just jogged my memory about the greatest purchase i've ever made in my life um so okay okay, without further ado i'm trying to figure out which one i'm gonna switch out all right well let me give my nominees while you're thinking about that in the meantime so for me Mm -hmm. i chose the star wars archives episodes one through three by paul duncan star wars women of the galaxy by amy ratcliffe a star wars art ralph mcquarrie from lucasfilm it's a big ass ralph mcquarrie book that has hundreds of pieces of concept art from ralph mcquarrie 
The Making of Star Wars by J.W. Rinsler. Had to throw Rinsler in there. Rest in peace. Amazing. I love him. I appreciate all the work that he's contributed to Star Wars. And we miss him dearly. And lastly, Dressing a Galaxy, The Costumes of Star Wars by Trisha Begar. All right. All right. All right. Excellent nominations. I have. Yeah. Dressing a Galaxy by Trisha Begar. Mm. The Art of the Last Jedi by Phil Shostak. Ooh. Women of the Galaxy by Amy Ratcliffe. Oh. The Revenge of the Sith Visual Dictionary. I didn't get the author on this one. My bad. And the Star Wars Archives, 1999-2005 by Paul Duncan. Who's the author of it, Brad? He's holding that Rot's Viz dick in front of him. The uh, James Lucino, who wrote Plagueis. James Lucino! And Tarkin. Yes. Which was not nominated today, I'm sorry, to Tarkin, but it is a great book. And Catalyst, a Rogue Run novel. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. So, Damn. we do have some overlap, but I would love for you to talk more about either Ralph McQuarrie or the J.W. Rensler book that I do not have on my nominations. Okay. Well, uh, first off, the J.W. Rensler book, I mean, this thing is a behemoth. Again, something that I got for Christmas one year, and it's the hardcover version for me. And it's like, you know, this with his other two books for Empire and Return of the Jedi are just cherished uh, for me. And I think it goes in such detail, like just how that movie was made and like all of the ins and outs of production and even a lot of the background for lucas's early life and what happened before star wars was made because i think that first star wars movie it all it all starts there like the fact Mm -hmm. that star wars even happened and existed in the way that it did and got to the screens for people to see it was like a miracle it was honestly a miracle you know here we are 40 plus years later talking about star wars on a podcast with all these new star wars things coming out continuously and it's just insane to think about like it was almost just like lightning in a bottle. Mm. This book just chronicles that so well. And J.W. Rensler is just, again, the work that he's put into Star Wars and telling the story of Star Wars behind the scenes with all of his other books. The Sounds of Star Wars is an amazing book by him as well. Uh, that actually has buttons that you can click throughout and it plays sounds like the special effect sounds and gives a little description of where that came from and how it was created Mm. just so good and then like the ralph mccrory one i think speaks for itself it's just these giant giant book about the size of the archives book and um, that's the question i was gonna ask yeah Yeah. there's two books inside of a giant sleeve hardcover sleeve and you take them out and it's just pages upon pages upon pages it's probably the most comprehensive collection of mccrory's artwork in like one single bound volume so Mm-hmm. Um, one of those things that I, I feel so fortunate to own because I don't think I don't even think it's in print anymore. So I'm very happy uh, I had to include it on there because, like, again, starts with Macquarie's artwork. His vision is the is the visual language of Star Wars today. Still, definitely, definitely. I will uh, give a shout out to the Revenge of the Sith Visual Dictionary. That Visual Dictionary has. You know how, like, in those sorts of books, like, most of it, you're reading it like a normal book, but every once in a while, they have one of, like, the pages that's tall. It yeah. goes tall. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the Tarful there's page, There's one right? of those. Yeah, that's the Tarful I page. I remember that page, yeah. Yeah, that's the Tarful page. So, I just have to shout out. <laughs> <laughs> we love a good visual um, dictionary. <laughs> yeah, we really do. Like... A key part of my childhood were those prequel visual dictionaries, and I am a huge Revenge of the Sith fan and a big Tarful fan, so yeah. um, I really love those. Also, Bail Organa has a page in there, he does. so yeah. really important to my childhood fandom. The other book that you know we don't double up on is The Art of the Last Jedi by Phil Shostak, and I was almost going to put another one of the Art of books here, but The Last jedi is just so dang pretty like you can't you can't say no i'm a little biased but i do (laughs) think that that um particular art of book provides some really interesting insights in the interviews and ultimately like there's just some really really stellar art in there including um you know costume concept art and just the locations i'm obsessed with it 
I totally agree with you, and I will never get sick of Phil Stozak's art of books. Just keep pumping them into my veins. You know, I don't even care. Like even the Tross one, I still really enjoyed. Like even though I don't like that movie necessarily that much, I still think like seeing all the concepts for anything is exciting and really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. The Star Wars art department is just incredible. It's just so good. But let's talk about the three that we do have in common. So Dressing a Galaxy by Trisha Bagar. Dressing a Galaxy is like one of those elusive books that took me so long to find like a, a solid copy of because again, it is out of print. Every time you find it, it's like three to four hundred dollars. I not almost more. one night went a little above and beyond, which was probably not the best choice. Um, almost. I tried to bid on the limited edition, which is like signed by Trisha and it includes actual swaths from the costumes. And it's in this like really gorgeous bound volume. I think it ultimately got sold for like $1,500. And I was like, oh, I can't justify that. So I did not buy it. And then I promptly went on Amazon and found one for like 200 bucks or something, which was, I mean, relatively cheap for this book, I feel like. And it was actually really good condition. And I was like, very surprised. It's hardcover. It's still got the sleeve intact, everything. We're good, fam. I got it. I own it now. And I love it. Yeah, I was able to check out a copy from the library through interlibrary loan. Thank you, nice. Illinois Library System, um, and read it. And ooh, it is a beaut. It is so amazing to see all of those costumes in such great detail. Mm-hmm. And just to have that as not only like a costume reference for cosplayers, but just for people who would want to see um a closer view of what these meta- fabrics felt like and materials, um, how they moved. Uh, and it's really, really incredible to see in that book. And yeah, for those who do not follow the book buying, you know, the elusive book buying star Wars land, $200 is a steal for that book. Yeah. Especially if you're not buying it in Japanese, which I believe there are a lot of copies available in Japanese. Um, yes. I'm not yep. sure the, what the reason is for that but it's much more difficult to find a copy in english um so if you see one out there in the wild and for under you know two hundred dollars grab it <laughs> like just grab, grab it, it because you can Doesn't either keep it for yourself or you can resell it at a higher cost <laughs> and make a profit um but yeah that is just an, a beautiful beautiful book especially as a prequel fan and as somebody who was obsessed with you know padme that's it that's it you know hats off to trisha's work on the prequels i i really wish they would bring her back for something i don't know why she hasn't already come back maybe it's her choice or maybe she's like i'm done never again star wars is intense for me you know but i mean she's just has such a knack for that stuff and even a lot of the behind Mm -hmm. the scenes featurettes with her and it's just so great it's just so great Mm -hmm. women of the galaxy by amy ratcliffe so amy has has been so busy in star wars she has written so much stuff the last couple of years and she's amazing as a person but i think this book really puts together like all of the uh women characters in star wars when you know for so long it felt like there was a, a big lack of women on screen uh in live action especially and uh in our books and this sort of and i feel like this book really highlights all of the women that you can find in Star Wars. And it's like, wow, there are really some incredible characters that have been developed over the years and included in these stories. And it's awesome to see them all in one place, especially with all these different artists who are included in the book um, and getting each of their own visual styles throughout it and seeing some of your favorites pop up uh, that you might not expect to pop up, but somehow do. Right. So it's very comprehensive. It's very fun. I love all the blurbs in there. For the different characters and um, Amy did such a great job kind of compiling this thing together. Yeah. And she wrote some really lovely blurbs about these characters and hers about Ray, you know, of course, prior to the rise of Skywalker, but her blurb about Ray and how anybody Ray is all of us, you know, anybody can be Ray because Ray is anybody. And um, that really hit that really hit when that came out. I think that's a powerful powerful passage she wrote there's also an incredible rose tico section Mm -hmm. god bless um but yeah but this book has beautiful art it really came at the right time um as the franchise was kind of you know putting out forces of destiny at the same time that this was happening Mm -hmm. and so there really was like a push towards women characters um and putting them at the forefront 
at least in that moment. And it was really, really nice. And I, I feel very happy to own one of these books and get to flip through it anytime that I would like to, you know, reading about characters that I love dearly or about characters that I haven't gotten to know because I haven't read their book or seen their episode of the TV. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a great book for anybody to own. And I will say, I hope Amy does an expanded version at some point. Would love to see I it. I would love that, you know, like including Fennec Shand, including Peli Motto, um, you know, the High Republic characters. characters. High Republic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so much opportunity. I would not be surprised if that gets a second release at some point. And you better believe I'll be buying that second book, too. So. All right. Sarah, tell us about the last book here, and I think this might be the winner but for us. Maybe not, but to kick it off, kick it off. What's our last okay. one that we have in common? So so this is going to sound funny because I might put my vote somewhere else. I'm just thinking about it. Uh, but my... This, this book, okay, is the best purchase I've made in my entire life. I had been eyeing this book since it came out, and I had been putting it on my Christmas list. I was like, if you buy me this book, I will be the happiest Sarah that has ever been. You will bring me the most joy. You will be my favorite parent slash friend slash family member. And nobody bought it for me. So I bought it for <laughs> myself. And that is Paul Duncan's The Prequel Archives. Um, and it is when they say that it is a foot and a half long by a foot tall and weighs 16 pounds. They were not lying. <laughs> they were not. This book is beautiful. It has got glossy pages. It's got, you know, an incredible narrative throughout about the making of the movies from Paul Duncan. Um, and i mean it just features photos that haven't been seen before it's incredible it's genuinely incredible and i can't believe i own it and i have no idea where to put it it's it's so beautiful i mean we are again prequel lovers at heart we believe in the prequel renaissance and having a book that sort of captures all of that because rinsler didn't write uh, making of for the prequels although there are making of books uh, for each of the three movies but this mm. really feels like the most comprehensive look at the prequels and for me it was a must own i was like i will pay whatever price there is for this book because i i need to have it like absolutely and um, i got really worried because i originally bought it from the publisher and it got canceled my order got canceled oh. uh so i was like kind of panicked because i was like oh god is this thing out of stock and Luckily, I was able to grab one, but I wonder if they're going to make a mini version. I don't think they will, but I would probably also buy that because <laughs> it's only like 20 bucks and it's a little more portable if I want to read it. Yeah. So um, on the go. But this thing is I just I think the red cover itself is just so gorgeous. And yeah, seeing pictures in there like, you know, George Lucas holding up his hands like Emperor Palpatine and Palpatine's right behind him also holding up his hands. And it's like the best picture ever. Um, I can't believe mm -hmm. that exists. That photo exists. It's amazing. Very iconic. So, I just I just love anything behind the scenes. I'm such a shill for that stuff and I will devour it all day long. I could just sit there and read that book for an entire day like with a hot cup of coffee and just do that and I would be very happy with my life. All right, Brad. So does that mean you're putting your vote in for Paul Duncan's The Star Wars Archives prequels? I could be swayed depending on what you're about to say, but uh, currently my vote is with the Archives book. I love the Archives book. There's no doubt about it. I really love the Archives book. But I also haven't gotten the, the opportunity to dive into it as much as I would like to. I still have more to explore in that book. And so for that reason, I'm going to put my vote in for Dressing a Galaxy by Trisha Bigger. Ooh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's the book. You know, it's, it's the book. Mm. If you're a prequel fan, if you're a book collector, that's, that's the book. That's the Holy Grail. And I don't have it yet, but I have read it. You know, if we're going to give it to anything besides the archives, I think that's that's an acceptable choice simply for the fact of scarcity and also for the fact that the prequels would not have been as good as they are without Trisha's work. So I, I will give that to you. I will I will concede You're that gonna point. Give it to me? I will concede that point. Don't tell anybody about it. Even though everybody's listening, I will concede. So are we are for best reference book? Are we seriously going with Dressing a Galaxy by Trisha Bigger right now? Is that what's that what's happening I, I will on do the it. award I will show? I will do it. Yeah. Hold up, everybody. Hold up. Moonlight won. Moonlight won. Dressing a Galaxy. You have won. <laughs> the Golden Gorg for best reference. Archives were the la-la land of the situation. Yeah, they were the front yeah. runner. They were the, they were the everybody so polished. Everybody thinks it's going to win. Plot twist. Psych. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I feel a little bit bad about like not giving it to prequel archives, but 
I feel if we're going to pick another one besides that, Dressing a Galaxy would be the best one. Because again, we love All the right. prequels, so I'm cool with yeah. that. Well, well, Maybe once I read all of the prequel archives, we'll come back and, and do like a lifetime achievement award for the prequel archives. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that anyway. brings us to our next category, which we are structuring just a little bit differently. We've just come up with a list of nominees together and we're going to go through them. And that is the best line or quote. Would we like to read these aloud? Yes. So our listeners can have an understanding of our nominations. Absolutely. All right. Kick it off with our first one. Okay, our first one is the last line of Leia, Princess of Alderaan by Claudia Gray. Spoiler alert. Yeah, here it is. My parents, Leia thought, my friends, my world. These are the things that the Empire can never take away. Oof. A doozy, a doozy. All right. So good. Next one, Brad. All right. Claudia Gray for Into the Dark. This is a Comac Vetus quote. How does the dark side take form anywhere? Sometimes I think we, the Jedi, must be somehow to blame. We who refuse to look at the Force in full to examine the darkness as well as the light. If the dark side were so not so alien to them, Comac suspected, they can more readily understand the nature of the idols. How can we split the Force in two? How can we justify such an act of violence? And it is violence, such a dividing, even the darkness divided from the light. Spicy, spicy. spicy. That's page 128. The next quote comes from Revenge of the Sith by Matthew Stover, and it is, The dark is generous, and it is patient, and it always wins. But in the heart of its strength lies its weakness. One lone candle is enough to hold it back. Love is more than a candle. Love can ignite the stars. Oh, Stover, come back and write some more Star Wars, my man. That's good stuff. Good stuff. All right. All right, so we have Alexander Freed from Victory's Price. This is a Mon Mothma quote. I believe in justice. I also believe that for a galaxy to survive, reconciliation must occur. The New Republic will not hold together if we spend the next 10 or 20 or 50 years divided into rebel and imperial. Yet true reconciliation requires honesty. It requires we stare at what we've done as a civilization and come to terms with it. The data bank can help, but only if the Senate and the galaxy as a whole has the appetite for self-examination over revenge. Hmm. This is some really good quotes. Hmm. Uh, surprise, surprise. The next quote also comes from Alexander Freed and Victory's Price. And it We're is from Yur- <laughs> Yurika Quell. I've accepted what I've done. I've tried to move past my guilt because it stopped being useful long ago. But I haven't forgotten a Cronus or anything else. I live with the memory of what I'm capable of every day. I need the memory to do better. And wiping out the records of what we've done seems like an awful lot, like helping everyone else forget. Oh, spicy, Quill. Spicy. Snaps. 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 All right, our can final... I, can I read this last one? Can I take this last one? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go okay. for it. It's from Daniel Jose Older's Race to Crash Point Tower, and it is King. Master Kunpar, his wisdom to Ram Jamaram. You must see the whole for the whole and each part for the role it plays, not for what you want it to be, not for what you fear it to be, just for what it is. And those are our list of nominations. We had an extended list for this one. Brad, do any of them stick out to you right away? I'm going to go for my pick right away. And these are go all for amazing quotes. I, they're just so good. I feel like they all speak to a, like such quintessential themes of Star Wars. But I feel like, I feel like overall... Matthew Stover's Revenge of the Sith novel just does it for me because Mm. that novel is just perfection from start to finish. It is the best novelization. It's not even just the best novelization. It is probably the best Star Wars book written like ever. Oh, wait, we don't have that category. I know, but that that (laughs) would that would win. That's not even a it's not even a, uh, a, a competition. Right. So. I mean, the fact that it's talking about how you know darkness and light and how there's always just kind of one lone candle to hold back the darkness Um, love is more than a candle and love can ignite the stars right and star wars is a love story it's always love that wins out the day and fights back against uh, evil oppressive forces right it's the love of anakin and padme that gives birth to two twins who balance the force it is the love of han and leia who give birth to a boy who yes falls to the dark side but comes back to the light in order to save the light through ray and uh it is it is just love of family of found family it's love of people who come into your life and are stronger than blood 
And I think that is just so important for every single Star Wars story. Mandalorian, Din Djarin's love for little baby Grogu and his little Gmail. Din's love keeps him going. You know, a man who is a lone wanderer with no purpose other than to kill and to seize bounties now has a purpose that is much bigger than that as a father. Um, so there's just so much that revolves around love. And um, I like the idea and the visualization of a, a lone candle. Um, you know, just mm. that one lone candle can cause a spark, you know, as Poe says, a spark to burn down the whole first order. That's all you need sometimes. It's just that one little spark, that one little ignition. And so I think it really captures the essence of Star Wars for me. Absolutely. I totally get where you're, all that is coming from. And you're right. Stover's language is evocative and poetic and the whole novel reads like this it's incredible it's really incredible but i might place my vote elsewhere um and i may or may not have come up with this list so these are all quotes that i specifically love a lot but okay like the leia princess of alderaan quote it's punchy you're reading that book and then you get to that final line and you're like shit she's gonna lose all those things in like three years the second quote it's the last part. How can we split the force in two? How can we def- justify such an act of violence? Ugh, spicy from Comac. And in the love can ignite the stars. That's just like that. That is like the opening to across the stars. And you're just like, you know, drowning in the beautiful strings of that song. You know, then we get Mon Mothma. She's talking about justice and reconciliation and actually confronting your wrongs in order to make rights. And then we got Quell who's saying like, I know that I have this past and I can't forget about it, nor can anyone else in order for us to move forward, in order for me to be a better person, in order for me to keep on this path that I'm on. And at the end here, you got to see a part for the part and the whole for the whole and every part for the role it plays. I, that speaks to me. That speaks to me. In fact, it speaks to me so much that I made it like my 2022 <laughs> intention. Like, like that was my... That was my thing that I went into 2022 with, is that quote. Um, so while it doesn't have the poetry that Stover's got, I think my my vote has to go to Daniel Jose Older on this one. Mm. That is a really great quote. And I think it's important to um, see every part for what it is versus what you want it to be. Um, that's an important way to live life. Ooh, but you're not about to give this up. I can feel it. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I put a Stover quote on that list. I should have known. You know, it's just, I, I think, I think the quote from race to crash point tower is, is so good. It's a good life lesson. But I think when we're looking at like the best lines and like, what is like a best line mean? Like what makes a good line to me? It's just like, you know, when you're getting punch after punch after punch at the end of the revenge of the Sith novel and you, you see the inside mind of Anakin Skywalker as he becomes Darth Vader and how, Mm. And how that dragon throughout the book continues to grip his heart and you are crying. You're sitting there crying, holding the book and you are just broken. And then tear stains on the final pages. Yeah. And then you read this and you're like, you're like, damn, there is some hope. Right. And so Mm. while I think the race to crash point tower line is incredibly written and is so good and is so important for our own lives and for star Wars, I think in the context of the book, Stover's for me is really like it's I, I can't let go of it because it is where it's placed, especially for me that that matters and makes it the best line because it, it, it is that the line itself is the lone candle of the book, you know? Mm, mm-hmm. OK. OK, you win. I think that's <laughs> I think that's entirely fair. You're right. Like tear stains on the pages. You're at the end and then you get this one final moment of like a clarity of a, of a spark, something, something that you can grasp onto. Yeah. Despite the hopelessness. Um, it's a lighthouse in a, in a tumultuous sea that is, yeah, that is trying to destroy you. And you, and you see one little bit of light peeking through the clouds. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So our golden gorg for best line or quote goes to the final lines of revenge of the Sith by Matthew Stover. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on from best line, we have best audio drama. And this is a bit of a limited category because there are only, you know, three canon audio dramas. There are some other like radio plays and those sorts of things from the Legends era. But 
are we qualifying kind of our scope of this uh, category to the canon? Yes. Audio dramas. Yeah, I uh, maybe in the future if we if we read more legends books, like maybe we can do an essential legends collection, Golden Gorgs. But for now, it is all it is all canon stuff. So, uh, what what were your nominees? Uh, well, I guess the <laughs> well the, the nominees three, are the, the three nominees. <laughs> the three nominees are Dooku Jedi Lost by Kevin Scott, Sarah Kuhn's Doctor Afra, and. Star Wars The High Republic, Tempest Runner, also by Kevin Scott. Double nominated. And in this category tonight, shout out to Kevin Scott. Yeah. This is his first double nomination. And he is <laughs> <laughs> what is your pick? If you had to pick one oh, of the three. Man. Oh man, you're making me choose. They're all I know, so they're good. all very good. I I am really okay, so I'm torn between two of these, and maybe you can help me out depending on your choice. So okay. I'm torn between Dr. Afra and Duke of Jedi Lost. This is so funny. <laughs> because you probably chose Tempest Runner, right? I chose Tempest Runner. <laughs> no help at all. <laughs> nope. Well, the good thing is, guys, we like all three of them. Um, uh, and we can't do a three-way tie. So yeah. Okay, so I I I'm I'm torn between those two because I think for Dr. Afra, I think Sarah Kuhn had a really big challenge to adapt a story that for the most part, most people knew, right? Because we've already read the story in the comic. So for her, she had to really introduce Afra to people who may have not read those comics and to mm -hmm. almost like recreate this character in a new way with uh, the voice of Emily Wu Zeller, who just really takes the story to new heights. And you have Black Kersantan in the book. You know, you have Darth that's, Vader. That's true. You have Triple Zero. You have... Uh, Triple Zero's little astromech droid. I'm forgetting the name right now. What is, what is the name of the little astromech droid? I, I don't. Remember. I have no idea. I think that alone is a challenge. And then for for Dooku Jedi Lost, you know, I love Dooku. I love the idea of the Lost Twenty, and I think that book really explores, like, you know, between like Sifo Dyas's visions and like what's under the Jedi Temple and like all these old Sith artifacts that seem to be hiding in this sort of gallery deep down in the depths, and um that to me is really interesting like this concealment that's happening and um assage to sort of getting bits and pieces of the story from dooku and his, about his sister and like all of that is just so fascinating so i think it was like the best look that we've gotten at dooku as a character and he is somebody who i've always thought is really intriguing as somebody mm -hmm. who left the order the first time we've ever heard of that happening you know dooku leaving the jedi order we're like what's that about this audio drama really like fills in those gaps 20 some years later past attack of the clones it's also got rail avaros oh yeah and he he's a guy's guy like he's he's a guy you know he's a real one <laughs> yeah my vote is for tempest runner because i feel like it elevates the star wars audio drama category even above the work of dr afra and of dooku jedi lost simply because it takes a narrative that we've only kind of gotten from like the first person narrating their story point of view to something a lot more complex in the storytelling. We're getting multiple points of view. Uh, yes, we're still following Lorna D throughout. However, she's not necessarily like turning to the camera and narrating her own story all the time. Mm. And that first scene when we have the characters in the bar and then it shifts over i believe either to lorna d or to avar chris right in the beginning i was immediately sold i was like oh this is something different and i loved that and then throughout the story i love the twists and turns we got um lorna's backstory and ultimately how that story ended it was a really exciting audio drama for me all right. You know, you've had me convinced now because now that I'm thinking about it, Tempest Runner really was sort of all different sorts of point of view and, and the way that it ebbs and flows between Lorna's past and present, I think makes mm -hmm. it a really interesting story and how what she learned from the past and went through was really informing her present and the decisions that she makes in real time. So you see that you kind of see the why as you see the as, as you see the what. Um Yeah. So I'll give that to you. I give that to you. And, you know, I think Kevin, Kevin has definitely been like the king of audio dramas for Star Wars. I wonder if we're going to get another one this year. I, I can pretty much 
almost guess that we will at some point, and maybe it, it's announced at Celebration. I would not be surprised if he's also doing an audio drama now, but who knows? Who knows? But I would also love to see the audio drama expand beyond Kevin. Um, again, Sarah Kuhn's Dr. Afra audiobook is just so freaking good. And uh, I would love to see more people get a crack at that medium because it is a fun one and um, definitely pushing the boundaries with each and every one. Because I think from like Dooku to Afra to Tempest Runner, it really kept evolving the medium. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's something that's really established over at the Big Finish, especially with uh, Doctor Who stories. And that's something that Kevin has contributed to and written for in the past. So this is clearly a medium that he's comfortable in. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the Star Wars side of things continue because the Big Finish work is really, really excellent. And the Star Wars work is is great so far already. So are we are we given it to Tempest Runner? I would say we can. Yeah. Why not? The points don't matter. The points don't matter, but these Golden Gorgs do. So this Golden Gorg (laughs) Award for Best Audio Drama out of the three we've gotten so far, according to the Friends of the Force, is Kevin Scott's Star Wars The High Republic, colon, Tempest Runner. (laughs) Congratulations to Kevin Scott and his two Golden Gorg Awards tonight, or today, or this morning, whenever you're listening. He is leading the winner board so far. Now, this brings us to a hot category. You know, in the middle of an award show, there's often a Lifetime Achievement Award, somebody who's been recognized for their work throughout their career, uh, for their body of work, as opposed to a singular performance. And we are so excited today to not not only recognize one favorite author, but two favorite authors, or maybe one, depending on who we pick. (laughs) Uh, But we will be uh, giving out this sort of Lifetime Achievement Award rather than duking it out, because the reality is they're all great. There are so many, there are so many authors I wrote down and was like, oh, here are the reasons why, here are the reasons why, here are the reasons why. And I don't know what to do. I feel like I can go with (laughs) the very conventional choice. That's a classic that like everybody agrees, or I can go with, I was crying on my floor at 2 AM, roll up in a ball (laughs) at the end of this one book sort of choice that, you know, like, what do I go with? What do I go with? Do I la la land it? Do I moonlight it? I will have to go with the incomparable Claudia Gray. Mm. That's a great choice. Yeah, everybody. And then everybody's like standing and they're applauding. They're like, yes, Queen Claudia. We, we knew it. We knew it. And I'm like, yeah, you knew it. <laughs> um, Claudia's work is so important to me because it was the first Star Wars canon novel that I read in Bloodline. It was the second Star Wars canon novel that I read in Lost Stars. And those books hold a very, very special place in my heart. Then we got Leia, Princess of Alderaan. Then we got Master and Apprentice. And then we got her contributions to the High Republic. And we have just been blessed with quad- quality Claudia Gray content. And I think that Star Wars is the better for it. And I don't even care that it's the conventional choice. It's just the truth. I have a special section on my bookshelf just for my Claudia Gray books. <laughs> so it had to be Claudia. Well, I think that is a very good choice. And for me, I, my first canon novel was Aftermath by Chuck Wendig, but Lost mm. Stars was immediately after. And I remember just not being able to put that book down, but at the same time, like trying to savor every minute of it because it was so good. And it did span so many Star Wars eras. And I was just like, this is just perfect. This is just amazing. Yeah. Star-crossed lovers, of course I want it. So I would love Lost Stars too. Just saying, just saying. But my 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 choice, my choice, which may have been your other consideration, and I'm going to choose it because um, I think I feel good to choose this because technically you haven't read one of the books from this person. You, you still got to read true. it. You still got to read That's it. That's true, I do. I'm choosing Alexander Freed because... Alexander Freed's body of work. He is one of the most published Star Wars authors. Um, he's done a lot of work in in Star Wars, and I think his universe that he's created within Star Wars. You know, between uh, you have Rogue One novelization, you have uh, Twilight Company, you have all three books in the Alphabet Squadron trilogy. He's got a short story, and from a certain point of view, Empire Strikes Back, uh, and he's just done so much and. I think his books present such a, a raw look at at like the people of the galaxy, like the ordinary people. 
the soldiers, the ones who are fighting these wars, the ones who have been beaten to their their worst moments and come back somehow. Uh, as we especially see that in Alphabet Squadron, and uh, I think the Alphabet Squadron trilogy is like the best Star Wars trilogy like ever written or shown or given to us because it is so perfect and it has such rich character stories uh, and where it all lands by the end is just so satisfying and it leaves you with hope you know we read those quotes mm-hmm. earlier those two quotes from victory's price if that gives you a taste of of what that book offers and you haven't considered picking up that alphabet Squadron trilogy now is the time because it is amazing but sarah you have to read twilight company at some point because and I would say that for anybody, because that is a great book. Like, I was just kind of turned off by it initially. I was like, yeah, Battlefront, like, it's a video game. I don't got to read this. But Twilight Company is, like, as rich with the characters as, like, the Alphabet Squadron trilogy, just in a different era. It is so good. And some of those characters later appear in the Alphabet Squadron trilogy. So you see a little bit of crossover uh, between these two bodies of work. And I think that's the brilliance of of alexander freed as he's thinking he's thinking big he's thinking uh inspirationally and he takes care of his characters for sure you know he doesn't just throw them away uh because of whatever their past might look like and whatever their future could or could not look like right um he asks the difficult questions and sometimes gives the difficult answers um, but also there's a lot of gray areas where you don't get the answers and you have to think for yourself and and form your own opinions uh and we see a lot of characters battle with that that feeling in his books for sure and my favorite alexander freed fun fact is that he is a very very serious plotter and that he plots out his books in great detail prior like outlining them before he sits down to write them and that i remember from star wars celebration 2019 is he doesn't really let himself let his characters have a lot of surprises for him. Like he pretty much just sticks to it. And you can really see that come through, especially in the alphabet squadron trilogy, because it is so meticulous and you can really dive into those characters psyche. And that is the thing that I love most about that trilogy. Yeah, absolutely. And if you haven't heard our interviews with both Claudia Gray and Alexander Freed on the podcast, quick plug, go check those out. Uh, We've had Alexander on twice and Claudia has been on once. So definitely recommend. So our Golden Gorg winners, once again, for the favorite author category, go to none other than Claudia Gray and Alexander Freed. Yay! Congrats. Congrats. All right, so now we're moving into the final three. So we're going to hit a, hit a really important stretch here between middle grade, YA, and adult. These are the big three. These are like, you know, you get to the end of the Oscars, you're waiting for best director, you're waiting for best picture best actor actress you know those are the those are the big coveted awards that they're going to show right final 10 minutes here we are and they're going to rush through everybody's speeches because they made time for other stupid shit that nobody wants so (laughs) or they'll just cut some categories altogether because they're dumbasses anyways well we didn't cut any categories today no we did not because we are smarter than the academy we might have to rush through our speeches just a little bit (laughs) we're 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 throwing a little shade at the academy i think they're going to cancel our invitation to the to the oscars so yeah, guess we're on the blacklist now. No. Oh man, what are we gonna do? <laughs> anyway, Anyways. that brings us to our best middle grade category. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. How about you go first? This is this is a good one. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I looked through some, of the, some middle- of the, yeah, I was like, oof. Okay. Some of these are my favorites. Yeah, um, yeah. My nominees for best middle grade are "The Mighty Chewbacca in the Forest of Fear" by Tom oh. Engelberger, "The Legends of Luke Skywalker" by Ken Liu. Of course. Race to Crash Point Tower by Daniel Jose Older, Cobalt Squadron by Elizabeth Ween, and A Test of Courage by Justina Ireland. Mm. So my nominees are Race to Crash Point Tower by Daniel Jose Older, The Last Jedi Cobalt Squadron by Elizabeth Ween. Shut up. Guardians of the Wills by Greg Rucka. That's a good one. Legends of Luke Skywalker by Ken Liu. And I chose Spark of Resistance by Justina Ireland mm. because I love a Porg and I have really good <sighs> nostalgia memories of that book too. So I'm a little biased, but I, I had a really good time. That was just like post TLJ pre Tross era. That sweet spot of star Wars glory and speculation and joy. So good. I wish we could go back there. I am 
so happily surprised that Cobalt Squadron ended up on both of our list. Yeah. Is it just because we are Rose Tico stands? Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> I was so thrilled. Uh, I didn't suspect that. I also got to take a second to talk about the Mighty Chewbacca in the Forest of Fear. I am going to fight for another book a little bit harder because it showed up on your list. But the Mighty Chewbacca in the Forest of Fear is an absolute banger of a book and every Star Wars fan should read it. It stars Chewbacca, K2SO, and a bounty hunter slash librarian. Okay? Okay. Okay? Are you kidding me? Is that not the greatest setup you've ever heard? And it has a lot of Chewbacca noises throughout. So if you listen to the audiobook, you'll hear all the Chewbacca noises, which is positively delightful. Highly recommend. But I'm going to fight for Legends of Luke Skywalker. That's going to be my pick here because there is no short story in the whole Star Wars universe better than fishing in the deluge. (laughs) That's it. Like, that's it. Well, this is actually might be a surprise to you, but that was going to be my choice. Because I think that book, uh, again... Now we're going even farther back. Forget post TLJ era. Let's think a pre TLJ era. That was the time to be alive. That was the time. That (laughs) was everything. Those months leading up to TLJ and then actually seeing TLJ, I was like living on cloud nine. And so getting Legends of Luke Skywalker, especially in the context of like we hadn't seen Luke in Force Awakens, he felt like this mystic. You know, he not only felt like a myth to Ray, he kind of felt like a myth to us. Yeah. Like, where has Luke Skywalker been? He's been gone for 40 years and we got barely a glimpse of him at the end of Force Awakens. So for us, we're like, what has Luke been up to? You know, we get a little bit of it here and there. And to actually see, you know, we got it in uh, Battlefront 2 that same year, I believe, right? Was that mm-hmm. that was um yeah. pre-TLJ. Yeah. So that seeing that and then getting all of these sort of myths told from people in the galaxy, and you don't know if they may or may not be true. And some of them are like a bit romanticized. Some of them are definitely heightened to um, Darth Jar Jar. Un- yeah, like unbelievable heights that you just you're like, that couldn't have happened. But at the same time, you're like, from a certain point of view, maybe. So <laughs> I think that alone was really cool. And it's like a myth within a myth, you know, and yeah, I think that's what I appreciate the most. Uh, Ken Liu is a is a great author. I think he is definitely uh, somebody who I would like to see return to the Star Wars franchise and write more books. And who knows? Maybe time will tell if he if he does return. Yeah, he also has been finishing writing the Dandelion Dynasty, which is mm. thousands of pages long if you put all four books together. So yeah. the last one comes out in June. Um, but oh my gosh, yeah. Please come back, Ken Leo. Because again, fishing in the deluge. Shout out from the mountaintops. Canon. Canon. so good Canon. so good i that was like really where like my love of seeing the force in other ways was sparked it was that story so specifically. good so, so good best middle grade the golden gorg goes to ken leo for his work in the legends of luke skywalker yeah. yay <laughs> our next category is a is a hopping category and it is the best ya novel young adult Brad, what are your nominees for this fine category? Alrighty. Well, we got Lost Stars by Claudia Gray, Leia, Princess of Alderaan by Claudia Gray, Out of the Shadows by Justina Ireland, Midnight Horizon by Daniel Jose Elder, and Crash of Eight by Zoraida Cordova. Okay. Alrighty. I've got Lost Stars by Claudia Gray, Leia, Princess of Alderaan by Claudia Gray, A Crash of Fate by Zoraida Cordova, into the Dark by Claudia Gray. Oh, yikes, Sarah. And Rebel Rising by Beth Revis. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of wanted to throw a different one in there. Rebel Rising shout out. Yeah. Yeah, Beth Revis coming back to uh, to write The Princess and the Scoundrel in a couple months. So Should excited. Should be great. Should be so amazing. Hyped. So hyped. I do want to shout that book out, though. I read Rebel Rising uh, during the pandemic. Um, I was like, I got to read this book at some point. And I just sat on my porch for like two days and read it. Um, it's amazing it's so good like if you are a Jen Urso fan it's just it's incredible it's it's really good like even for a YA book too it goes to some dark places so it um does. would yeah. recommend yeah um do all of the rest of them we have lined up or do you not have into the dark I do not have into the dark I have uh, midnight horizon instead wow we we're, we're really covering a lot of territory here um I just have to say into the dark introduce geode king 
was so funny, so thoughtful about the Force. Comac Vitas, Wreath Stylus, some really, really incredible characters in that book. And I just loved that book so, so much. Um, so that's why it's on my list. So my gut is having me lean towards Lost Stars. And maybe it's because I'm a little nostalgic and, you know, it's it's the first YA Star Wars book I read. But I think it is really fascinating to watch two people on opposite sides of the war who love each other and still somehow are like tied their fates are tied the fact that it spans so much of the original trilogy like all the way up through the battle of jakku and the way that their stories intersect with this cataclysmic event that shook the galaxy and changed it for good Mm -hmm. I think it's so cool. And, you know, at the time, this is pre-TFA we're talking, we didn't really know much about what happens after Return of the Jedi, right? So it was like our first taste of what is the Battle of Jakku and what does that all entail? And, and you know, we, we kind of get glimpses of it too and, and the Battlefront games and you sort of start to put the pieces together. And I feel like between... um you know, Chuck Wendig's book at the time and Lost Stars, those two, those two things coming out and Shattered Empire, the comic, those three things came out mm. pre-TFA. Um, and I was like, I got to buy those right away. It's canon. We're, we got canon it's now. Canon. You know, I, I never read Legends because I was like, there's just too much. And we finally got canon. This is one of the first books I picked up. So um, for me, it holds a special place in my heart because I think it really did help propel me into uh, Star Wars publishing and Star Wars reading. And um, really changed a lot for me. And I think the characters themselves are great. Sienna and Thane are awesome. And I, I love how we see some of the 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 gray areas, you know, like what happens when you're a stormtrooper and you watch Alderaan blow up and some of your people lived on that planet, right? And you're from there. Yeah. Uh, what mm-hmm. happens? How do you feel about that? And also, how do you feel when you leave because you see that? And then, you know, your friends don't. So there's just so many complexities to that book. And I think it's amazing. It's the first time where it really kind of paints a picture of people who joined the empire and like uh, at least to my knowledge and like what if i've read uh first time i got to experience that sort of story of like what happens when like good people get indoctrinated into these things and and then they kind of realize and wake up from that and say like oh shit this is bad yeah it is a special special book but i do want to like say something about uh, a crash of fate by Soretta cordova because that book i ate it up yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, we're getting these theme park tie-ins, theme park I'm never going to be able to go to, and, and because it's, you know, so expensive to go to Disney or whatever. And I read that book. The book itself is gorgeous. It has the printed cover. You, ha- you love to see it. We love to see it. But that story takes place over 24 hours. It's romantic. It's got action. It really takes you through that, too. It is a true delight of a book. And so I just want to give it its time here on our award show. And speaking of Zoraida writing the first ah! adult novel of Phase Two of the Higher Public, amazing! I cannot amazing. wait for convergence. <laughs> At the end of the day, though, I think I must give this to Lost Stars too. Lost Stars yeah. is is the runaway winner just because it's Lost Stars. Similarly to Dressing a Galaxy, it has that legendary sort of status that makes it iconic. It is the perfect book to recommend to people who haven't read Star Wars before and they are want to get into it. It's accessible. Yeah. It's it's got the action, it's got the romance, it's got this like sweeping star-crossed story. <sighs> it's just so good. Give us a Lost Stars too. The Golden Gorg goes to Lost Stars Yay. by Claudia Gray. We're such we're such suckers for romance in Star Wars, really. You can tell. Like we are just <laughs> Between Alzar Man and Avar and Lost Stars and Raylo, it's, it's, it's all there. It's all there. It's all there. It's there. all there. Which brings us to our final category. Will there be romance in this category? Only time will tell. Best adult novel. My picks mm. are Bloodline by Claudia Gray. Victory's Price by Alexander Freed. Revenge of the Sith by Matthew Stover. The Rising Storm by Kevin Scott. And Alphabet Squadron. Also by Alexander Freed. It's a great list, Sarah. It's a great list. All right. My list is uh, Victory's Price by Alexander Freed, Revenge of the Sith by Matthew Stover, The Rising Storm by Kevin Scott, Bloodline by Claudia Gray, and Resistance Reborn by Rebecca Roanhorse. Ooh. Love it. Love it. Okay. 
Okay, uh, so we clearly should have gotten someone else on the podcast who would give us all of the different recommendations because there are like so many books that we haven't even touched yeah. on this awards show. Yeah. Do you, do you have that, an honorable mention for adult book? Oh, an honorable mention for adult book. Um, Something that like almost was in, but didn't quite make it in. Aftermath Empire's End. So freaking good, isn't it? Is really good. We should cover those on the podcast. That's all I'm saying. We all, that means I'd have to read them again, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's really a really good. good one. Yeah. And uh, also the Rogue One novelization. I will say I really miss Chuck Wendig as well. It's really unfortunate that we don't have him as a Star Wars writer anymore because he's, he's written some good stuff. It's true. For me, Dark Disciple was just, just on the edge. Just on the edge. See, and I just haven't read it yet. So that's, so that's good. the one that I'm missing out on. And But like also uh, Inferno Squad, we can't forget about that one. Oh, so yeah. One. Amazing. Yeah. Christy Golden. I mean, come on. She's written some amazing stuff. Yes. Okay. So going back to our list. Yeah. I think the ones where we differ, you do not have Alphabet Squadron on your list. No. And what do I, I not have on my list? Yeah. I use the Victory's Price as the sort of. Uh, I did both of them. That's so bold. what was the one that bold i didn't strategy. have uh you didn't have resistance reborn oh yes which uh the return of ransom Casterfo. yes and it is the best sequel to the last jedi i will say um <laughs> in my my humble opinion but uh that book again pre-tross kind of the excitement of tlj still firing through my body and getting like our first look at okay what does the resistance look like on the run now like they were defeated at the battle of crate for the most part although they really weren't hope still lives the galaxy will be saved eventually but also like the rebels kind of have their back against the wall in a, in a way and um the first order i think definitely has the edge so it was just so fascinating to get like leia and ray we get a little bit of rose and we get poe and finn who like go to get dressed up together and like suit and ties basically and and like go to this like go to this like event uh masquerade event sort of and like that's really good and it fed my my finn poe loving heart and rebecca roanhorse like her first star wars novel it was just such a good time to read that book that was like one of my favorite star wars reads and um we we did a whole episode with um the living forest podcast back way back pre-tross where we talked all about it um and i interviewed rebecca roadhorse here on the podcast and it was just such a it was just such an exciting time and like i just i love that book honestly it was just it was so good yeah that's a that's a really that's a really good one um i don't think i have anything to add except for also we get uh snap and oh yeah um, oh yeah wedge, wedge and, and nora wexley i mean nora like, wexley this book so has bring all the after of that yeah. it has everybody together it's pretty incredible how she weaved everybody's kind of stories together i think that was the most shook that i felt seeing nora wexley back <laughs> from chuck yeah. wendig's books i was like holy shit i was like what what is going on here and i cannot believe <laughs> after reading resistance reborn and then watching okay watching snap wexley die on screen and then wedge being like good shot then, lando like, i'm like what is going on your son just died and then, and then we get like kare kun being sad it hurts just, it hurts anyway know, anyways jj did you so read have, resistance reborn come on man come on <laughs> we have four novels that line up here together and we've we've already given the rising storm a big prize and we've already given claudia gray a big prize and Alexander Freed, a big prize. And Matthew Stover, a big prize. <laughs> One of these folks Each is going home. Each of them have home. received with, <laughs> with the same With another prize. award. With another award. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm between two. And those two are Victory's Price and Revenge of the Sith. Now, I do Victory's Price because I ended up devouring that book. And the themes in that book are like, whew. And the way that that book deals with trauma and reconciliation and justice oh my lord it is spicy so spicy stuff so good the other one i have is of course revenge of the sith by matthew stover again we've discussed it before it's poetry the whole book is poetry this is the biggest brain of star wars these two books i mean you got stover <laughs> you got freed it is like kiati mundi sized brains <laughs> so many brains and I hate that I'm leaving Bloodline out of that conversation, but I it's also been just like so long since I've read that book. Yeah. And I love Ransom Castorfo. 
But like, woo, that last chapter of Victory's Price, man, that's that's the good stuff. Who wrote on the napkin, Sarah? Who did it? Who wrote on the napkin? It was Ben Solo. Brian, jo- Brian Johnson himself wrote on the it napkin. Was ben, it was Ben Solo. RIP to that statue of Baylor Ghana. We miss you. <laughs> RIP I mean, Panaka. he's already dead. But. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, Panaka, spicy figure. Um, Okay. Okay. Do you, do you have any different, you know, top choices other than Victory's Price, Revenge of the Sith that you want to add back no, into this conversation? I, or are I, we kind of there? I think we're there. I think, you know, Victory's Price and <laughs> Revenge of the Sith are definitely the front runners for me. And I think if I had to choose, if somebody said choose right now or or else, I'd be like, Revenge of the Sith. Because that book, I, it was just such such an ethereal experience and, and and both are but victory's price is too i think it's the poetry of stover's book i think it's that time of star wars you know we're concluding the skywalker saga as we know it then and stover just punches us right in the heart you know it's and then like he does it for 400 pages for 400 pages you know and it's like every single word on the page is just so like I, I when I first picked it up, I was intimidated by the book because it was so beautifully written. I was like, I don't know half these words, I feel like. I'm like, Stover, you're doing something to me, man. You're making me feel all sorts of things. You're making me feel like I'm in academia, like I'm doing a dissertation. And you're making me go to dictionary.com. Really though. I mean, the the stops that he pulls out are just incredible and if you don't already follow the <laughs> Revenge of the Sith novel bot on Twitter, um, please go do that because that is the best follow you'll have all day because you'll just be, you know, going on Twitter, doom scrolling, and then one of the lines pops punched. into your feed and you're just like, oh God. And some of those, some of those are on purpose. They do it. They time those some, like they timed a Kenobi quote with the Kenobi trailer. And I was like, you, you animals, how could you do that to us? <laughs> you're making us feel. But I think the book is just, again, it's just so perfect. Um, I think you really, like I said it earlier, I think it is the best Star Wars book. And Victory's Price is is really close behind, but as an adaptation of source material on screen into book form, it's impressive what he did and how he elevated that movie to like a whole new way. Like it's just, a, it's almost like a different movie in, in some ways. I got to put my vote in for victory's price. I know Ooh. this is making this last category really, really oh, spicy, but do you remember back? Do you remember back when we were reading that book and all of the chapter title names it's true. were music related. And then you get towards the end of that and you're like record scratch stares screen to camera. Oh my God. All of these are lost songs Oof! because all of these worlds were either like killed by cinder operation center or you know destroyed in some other way r.i.p polis masa speaking of revenge of the sith hard to learn that one yeah (laughs) yeah um poor uba droid but that that alone was brutal and then this Mm. book was brutal will lark just wanting to go home the last chapter of that book talking about the hard work that these characters are doing to move forward and i feel that i know we talked about love can ignite the stars as a piece of hope as that spark you know for future generations but for me the last chapter like the epilogue sort of chapter of victory's price is not just the spark of hope but it is tangible hope it is the assurance for the future and it is delicious so I don't know. I'm I I'm not I'm not fully over to the Revenge of the Sith side. It's a toss up. This one's a toss up. I mean, should we just should we split it? I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm at a loss. Cut, the, cut the golden gorg right in half. Cut, cut the gorg in half. <laughs> a plot twist with a lightsaber. Just cut it in half. Just like Anakin. Cut it right in half with the lightsaber. You know what? The lightsaber may in Revenge of the Sith make fashion. it an easy slice. You yeah. know, it may make it an easy slice. We we could fight <laughs> about this for another 10 minutes, or we could just agree to 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 slice the gorg. Slice the gorg. Is that offensive though to our winners? Like to just get half a gorg? They like feel like they're just getting scraps. No, they can 3D print the other half. It's all good. Okay, cool. And then it could be like a friendship bracelet. They can bring their gorg halves together. Yeah. And know that they just are the winners. Yeah. 
Okay. I think I did. Did we decide it? Did yeah. we decide it by not deciding it? Yeah. Let me just grab something real quick. All right. <laughs> All right, Gorg. You've had your time, but now it is over. And now you share custody between Alexander Freed's Victory's Price and Matthew Stover's Revenge of the Sith. Congratulations to our Golden Gorg winners. Henceforth, you shall be known as Half Gorg. <laughs> all right brad do you have any honorable mentions of books we did not talk about on this year award show we're not closing out the night with our big award we have a couple oh. more things to talk about and then we're gonna go so we've gotten to the big award but now we're at the after party any honorable mentions Woo-hoo. okay i mentioned a couple but we got the sound of sounds of star wars by jw rinsler we got the aftermath trilogy uh, by chuck wendig uh shout out to timothy zahn for writing like so many star wars books i can't even keep track of them anymore but go you yeah, sir 30, keep, keep doing it I, I can't i can't keep up with you um <laughs> and shout out to fakpov that anthology series Fak-pov. so good i cannot wait yes for return of the jedi uh hopefully next year holy crap if we get that announcement um, sending uh-huh. sending thoughts and prayers with all sincerity to the editors and yeah. publishing team over at Del Rey for making those books happen. That's a lot to coordinate. I would I would love a uh I would love a Max Rebo story is all I'm saying. Or maybe a Cobb Vanth story. Uh that would be a twist. Mm, that would be a twist. That would Anyways. be a twist. Yeah. My honorable mention, well, I have to give a huge, huge shout out here at the after party to the audiobook narrators absolute icons of voice amazing who helped bring these characters to life in the audiobook format what would we do what would we do without them i don't know like i genuinely do not know i have listened to so many star wars books as audiobooks january lavoy narrated bloodline which was my first star wars canon novel and her performance as leia and as the narrator of that book was so indelible to me just so iconic so shout out to audiobook narrators shout out also to my favorite really really silly reference book which is yoda's galactic atlas it is a <laughs> lego book it's hilarious there's like reviews from people and then like there's like a one-star view review from a droid and it's like they don't serve our kind here on tatooine it's very iconic it's very funny i highly recommend you go seek out your local yoda's galactic atlas peak humor throughout so those are my honorable mentions. I will also shout out one final book, uh, The Incredible Cross Sections. Any of them? Any of any them. of them? Yes. Amazing. They should do more cross sections. I think they did them for Rise of Skywalker, Last Jedi, Force Awakens, or was it just Force I think Awakens? So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Oh, I have no idea. Maybe oh, I should no, get that Last one, Jedi. There's cross one sections. for Last Jedi. Okay. Also, but while we're here, speaking of the Last Jedi, I have to mention Last Jedi by Jason Fry. Oh, that book yeah. described Leia's Force sensitivities as like sensing other people's emotions and like Mm. having a really keen understanding of like their emotional state. Um, And I thought that made Leia really powerful and really strong and really in tune with the force in her own unique way. And I adored that about that book. And it was also just really excellent. So yeah. Shout out. Well, Sarah, I think that uh, puts the golden gorgs at an end. Put a bow on it. Congratulations. Pack it up for to next year. To all of our winners and our nominees, um, your Golden Gorgs or half of Golden Gorgs will be mailed to you promptly. In approximately um, 95 years. Takes a while. Yeah. For the Gorgs season. We don't have the sort of technology to <laughs> make the Golden Gorg yet. Um, but no, seriously, uh, <laughs> this is all good fun. And we are so grateful to like be in the presence of so many amazing, amazing books and authors who make their living, you know, bringing us these incredible stories. And yeah. We're very grateful for these stories because they've brought us together as friends of the force. And, you know, they have brought the Star Wars community together with their really thoughtful themes and characters and storytelling. So shout out to all of the books. Yeah. You know, we are huge champions of Star Wars publishing on this podcast. What started out as sort of a a podcast covering an array of topics, which, you know, we still we still cover many topics here. But I think primarily now we are a, a book podcast in many senses. and. Um, I think if you are limiting yourself just to TV or movies in Star Wars, you are missing out on like half the pie of Star Wars that you could be eating because these books are just as good as anything else and um, even better than some things that we're getting on screen and on film. So I think give it give it a chance. Give that next Star Wars book a chance. Take it take a dive into it 
and see what you might discover on the other side. And, you know, it is such a joy to talk about books on this podcast as a forum because um, there is so much to discuss, like all the work that goes in from the authors to the editors. It's a lot. It is a lot to, mm-hmm. to make a good story that is on a page for like 400 pages. It is not easy to do. And so for us to you know really sit here and pick those apart is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And um, find so much meaning in these stories, too, like you said. It's just uh, it's it's just so much fun and, and such a joy. So thank you to yeah, thank you to Star Wars Publishing, Del Rey, Disney Books, Abrams Books, all everybody, DK, everybody, Chronicle, Chronicle, everyone, yeah. So awesome, awesome stuff. So we have had the awards ceremony, the after party, and now we're at the very, very exclusive and by only after after party where we <laughs> are talking for just a moment about the ninety fourth Academy Awards, which are happening or will have happened on Sunday, March 27th um, in the evening. And who knows? We're recording this beforehand, so it could be the best thing the Oscars has ever done is this telecast. It could be (laughs) an absolute mess. We genuinely have no idea yet, but this is the 94th time they've done these things. And you and I, Brad, as friends of the force, as movie lovers, Mm. have some opinions on the Oscars. We do. And maybe the maybe the first of those is that this telecast may not be great. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But I we don't, don't know yet. Don't know. If you're listening to this in the future, you can either be like, they really knew, or they were dumb. It was actually genius and they just couldn't see it. Who knows? Who knows? But Brad, do you have any picks or movies, you know, from last year that you wish were nominated? And what are your picks or movies that you would recommend to any listener or friends of the force? There's a lot of conversations to be had about like Oscar viewership and like mm. why people watch the Oscars and why people maybe aren't watching the Oscars. And I think, I think, uh, I don't know. I heard there's a lot of talk about nominating Spider Man No Way Home. And like, I don't know if that's necessarily the right answer to, to nominate that for best picture, um, to like attract more viewers who want to see like Tom and Zendaya at the Oscars. Who knows? I, I don't know. I'm not, I am not, I mean, the they should be at the Oscars. They should have at least, an aside. yeah, they, they should at least invite some of that star power, you know, like Spider-Man No Way Home doesn't need the nomination, but you should invite the cast, give them a table. So I don't really have as much of a snub as much as I do is just like invite star power, let people enjoy the Oscars and also don't cut the categories that are actually Ooh. the things that make movies happen. You can't not cut editing and visual effects and score like all these important things that like are essential to films being made and you're cutting them from the telecast for what's probably going to end up being like really stupid bits um from uh, whoever is hosting and like wasted time right so um those are kind of my two cents but i will say like in terms of in terms of like who's on this list um there's a lot of there's a lot of good movies that have come out this year for sure. And um for the most part, like every every movie in that category is like pretty good. So do you have a couple of recommendations for our listeners? Uh I would recommend uh personally King Richard. Uh I'm a huge Will Smith fan, and that was like a really good performance by him. And I'm a huge tennis mm-hmm. fan. I love Serena and Venus. So seeing like their story and the perspective of their dad and like the role that he played in their in their upbringing and their careers um it was really powerful i think it's the feel good movie of the year so i would check mm. that out coda is also very good again very feel good film very lighthearted um about family and um about like you know coming of age that sort of thing i still have not seen drive my car or west side story but i know i've heard really great things about drive my car so i'm excited to uh, eventually watch that I think I'll say that ultimately, like, I agree with you, like they shouldn't be cutting categories, whether they be, you know, the categories that make film happen or the shorts categories. The shorts are our next generation of filmmakers. They elevate the short film to the level that all these feature films get. And I really respect and appreciate that because other places they aren't, you know, held in the same regard. Um and so I love championing the short film categories. So like there's, there's so much good stuff there. Um, one of my favorites from years past is called the neighbor's window. Uh, excellent short film. Um, my favorite picks, you know, the ones I would recommend that you, the listener see, I have six. Um, I have more than six, but I'm trying to narrow it down to six. They are two of my favorites, two musicals, th- three musicals, three musicals at seven and two short films. 
my two favorites. The Worst Person in the World, nominated for Best Original Screenplay and Best International Feature. It is an incredible film. Uh, it's from Norway uh, by Joachim Trier, and it is the conclusion of his Oslo trilogy. It tells the story of Julia, who is a woman who is in a relationship with a slightly older man. She loves this man, but she feels a little stagnant in this relationship. And then she meets this other man who she kind of... Um, she says she doesn't they say they don't cheat but perhaps they do and she's just trying to find her way in the world as somebody who has had a really meandering path so far and i think this movie is amazing the performances are amazing and renata rensva as julia is like the biggest snub for me as in leading actress her performance is incredible and there is there's nothing artificial about it at all the other movie i'd How like do to I watch re- that film I, I need you to see can't this film. yet you can't yet you oh, have to go to the movie me. if you have it in a movie theater it's that's where you can find it right now i assume that it will be <sighs> you know streaming or available to rent um vod sooner rather than God later damn. but you I've know but you're like so long to watch this it's like the it's portrait of a lady me. on fire phenomenon like people were talking about that as far back as i want to say july i think the early film festivals and i did not see it until like february or march of 2020 so like it was like nine or ten months it was crazy um but the other movie i really want to recommend to you that's one of my favorites it is accessible online and it is summer of soul the documentary directed by quest love it is joyous and incredible and an incredible document of history it has these brilliant performances and really gives you a different perspective of specifically in music in 1969 you think woodstock you think you know hippies um you think a lot of white people um and this festival completely you know flips it on its head uh and also is just again an incredible historical document that i cannot believe that all of this footage was just like sitting in a basement for 50 years i mind-boggling my musical is for you. West Side Story, a must, a classic. If you just watch the America sequence uh, time and time over, like I will not be upset with you. It is incredible. I have done that. Cyrano, nominated, I think, just for best costumes. This musical is ridiculous, but it includes Ben Mendelsohn singing a villain song. So, oh man, you need to go see it for that. Star Wars I fans, think we need the Rogue One special edition now with Orson Krennic's musical number. I agree. I agree. But this Make is like happen, a lovely. Has a great performance from <laughs> Peter Dinklage and is just really well done overall. Um, but you have to embrace the camp of it a little bit. And then my last musical recommendation is Tick, Tick, Boom. This is uh, such so a good. brilliant performance by Andrew Garfield. Um, if if Will Smith like weren't in the picture for like weren't like the front runner for best actor, I would give it to Andrew Garfield. I think his performance oh, is genuinely incredible there's no there's no like line between his performance of jonathan larson and jonathan larson it's it's pretty incredible he sings he's brilliant um and this is a really really great effort from lima mel miranda and also if you're a theater kid like myself or just like a theater person at all you will notice people in the background of this movie because everybody and their mom is in the background of this movie in the theater world it's amazing uh and my shorts for you are the queen of basketball this is a short documentary that might win the best documentary short category it is about um like the first woman who was who was the first person drafted into the nba uh she tells her story she is such a energetic narrator and this story is genuinely incredible um and then the other short that I have for you is called Please Hold. It is a live action short. It is about a man who lives in a dystopian sort of society where he is picked up for a crime and uh, is in jail and is trying to get out. And that's all I'm going to tell you. You should just you should just watch it. Um, so those are my recommendations. And I will shut up now because I could go for much longer. <laughs> A lot of good films to see this year i i did a terrible job of of like watching everything before the oscars i just time time slipped by me but um maybe next year maybe, <laughs> maybe next, next year, year i'll do more of them um but you know what there's always room to watch these after the oscars you don't have to watch them before the oscars because these are all That's really good true. films that you should check out at any point in time um i will say my too early to call 2023 predictions batman everything all right anyways batman okay very very seriously let me oscar next year i think it will get six nominations if they run a campaign if they run a campaign for it i think it needs to be nominated for best picture if they if they really want to go for it 
with above the line nominations, I think it could earn eight to 10 nominations. That's our very, very early predictions here. I'm right where I'm right there with you. Batman yeah, has a best lot picture. going for it. Yeah. Best picture. I don't best even picture, care. Batman. Again, you know, No Way Home is like, eh, like for best picture, don't need it. Batman. It's yeah, the flair. It's needs the flair to be best scene. picture. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. In the end. It's 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 the cinema of it all it's with the, the chef's kiss. <laughs> um, anyways. But that wraps up our entire episode here on Friends of the Forest. So we talked about the Golden Gorgs. We talked about the Oscars. We gave out some amazing awards to some amazing people and some amazing bodies of work. And we are here at the end. So thank you all for tuning in. If you want to hear more from Sarah and I, you can follow us on Twitter, Letterboxd, and Goodreads. Speaking of Letterboxd, if you want to see what we're watching, that is the place to do it. So make sure to check out all the films that we're watching and see our witty reviews that we post over there. And uh, Sarah also has her Instagram, Sarah's Puzzled Pages, where she posts all about books all the time. So great page to follow. And wherever you're listening to this podcast, make sure to subscribe to the show so all of our future episodes just drop right into your podcast feed and you can hear us wherever you go. And if you have an extra second in your day, please leave us a review because it helps other folks find the podcast and join our Star Wars discussions as well. We also have a Patreon where tiers start at just a dollar. And if you enjoyed our conversation around things like Revenge of the Sith, we have a whole conversation over at our $5 tier on Star Wars by the book um, where we talk in depth about how amazing that novel is. So we are going through the novelizations. Very fun. Uh, and we are so, so grateful for for all of our patrons, truly. Uh, Amy, Anna, Brian, Carol, Cheryl, Clay, Danny, Deborah, Donnie, Elegy, Huang, Jen, Knights of Ren, Levi, Leanne, Lindsay, Lucy, Neil, Rob, Saber Bouquet, Sky Talkers, Travis, and T. Thank you all so much for being patrons. Yes, thank you all once again. Next up on the podcast is our big coveted event of the year. It is Attack of the Clones April. So get ready, folks, because Woo! every single week we got new episodes coming. Attack all of about the Clones. Attack, Attack of the, the Clones. Clones. Attack, Attack of the Clones. Attack, Attack, Attack. Attack. We're attacking you with Attack of the Clones all month long. But friendlyly, in a friendly way. Get ready, because we are so excited to celebrate the 20th anniversary of one of the best Star Wars films. So get yourselves it's ready. Iconic. It's, iconic. it's so good. It's so good. So until then, folks, may the force be with you always. 